Hello students, Ms. Swanson here, and today we're going to look at how to predict the products of synthesis reactions. If you haven't yet watched the video on synthesis reactions, please watch that one first. I'll put a link in the description box below, and then come back to this video afterwards. So we have two learning goals for today. To predict the products of synthesis reactions involving the formation of ionic compounds, and predict the products of synthesis reactions involving metal oxides and non-metal oxides. So let's take a look at our synthesis reactions just as a review here. Two or more substances react to produce a single compound. So the key in a synthesis reaction is that there's only one single product. And the reactants may be individual elements or they may be compounds. So there are three types. Uh, we're only going to look at two of them specifically and only certain circumstances of those two. Many types of single or sorry, many types of synthesis reactions have multiple products that could be formed, and you need to do some chemical analysis to actually determine which element has or sorry, which compound has been formed. Since we're not doing these experiments in the lab, we're doing them on a piece of paper, we can't actually determine which compound has been formed. So for many of these, we'll skip and we'll just look at the ones where we know for sure which elements are being formed, or sorry, which compounds are being formed. So the first type is when two elements form a compound, and we're only going to look at the case where ionic compounds are formed, not covalent compounds. The next is when an element and a compound form a new compound, and we're not going to look at these ones in any specificity. And then the last is when two compounds form a new compound, and we're only going to look at oxides, so metal oxides and non-metal oxides, um, the formation. So let's take a look at the first one, when two elements form a compound. So if you have a metal and a non-metal, then you end up with an ionic compound. So for example, sodium metal and uh, diatomic chlorine, when they come together, you end up with sodium chloride and ionic compounds. If you're dealing with a univalent metal, so anything on the periodic table where we determine the ionic charge based on its position in the periodic table, then these produce an ionic compound and we determine the, the uh, formula of the compound based on either crossing over or the zero sum rule. If we have a multivalent metal and the non-metal, in this case we don't always know for sure which element is, or sorry, which compound is actually going to be formed because there are several possibilities. However, for this course, we're always going to assume the most common ion is used. So for example, iron, it could be iron 2 plus or iron 3 plus. Iron 2 plus is the more common ion, so we're always going to assume the product is using iron 2 plus. Now, how do you know which one is more common? If you look on the periodic table and it lists all of the possible ionic charges, the one that's listed at the top or the one that's listed first if they're written horizontally is always the one that's the most common ion, ionic charge. And then let's look at the next one, when two compounds form a compound. This is actually quite rare, and the compounds must be small, they must be very simple in order to make a larger compound. And we're only going to look at the reaction of metal and non-metal oxides reacting with water. So let's take a look at the non-metal oxides first. When non-metal oxides react with water, they produce acids. So for example, carbon dioxide, carbon is a non-metal, so non-metal plus oxygen, so it's a non-metal oxide. When it reacts with water, it produces carbonic acid. So that's an acid that's produced by a non-metal oxide reacting with water. Metal oxides react with water to produce bases. So for example, sodium oxide, sodium is a metal, and it has oxygen attached to it, so it's a metal oxide. When it reacts with water, it produces sodium hydroxide, which is a base. So metal oxides produce acids, or sorry, non-metal oxides produce acids, and metal oxides produce bases. So let's take a look at some examples here. Here we have potassium and nitrogen coming together to form a compound. Now these are just two individual elements. One is a metal, one is a non-metal, so they're going to form an ionic compound. So we have potassium 
and nitrogen coming together. We know that nitrogen has a three plus charge, potass sorry, potassium has a one plus charge, nitrogen a three minus charge. When we cross them over, we end up with K3N. Uh, and this one, we're going to have a solid there. If we have magnesium oxide and water reacting together, this is a metal oxide reacting with water. We know that metal oxides produce bases, so they're going to produce hydroxide bases. So we're going to end up with magnesium hydroxide. And because magnesium has a 2 plus charge and hydroxide a 1 negative, then we need to put a subscript 2 with the hydroxide. So the hydroxide goes in brackets when we do that. Here we have a multivalent ion, so we can either use a 2 plus charge or a 3 plus charge. Here I've told you specifically to use the 3 plus charge, so that's the one that we're going to use. So here we have iron and bromine coming together. So if we use the 3 plus charge, then it will be Br3, and this will be an aqueous compound. So iron 3 bromide, and so here we need to do a little bit of balancing. We have two of these, we add three of those and two of those, then we're going to end up with a balanced chemical equation. Now let's take a look at a last example. Here we have a non-metal oxide reacting with water. We know that non-metal oxides react with water to produce acids, and the acid that's produced from um, sulfur trioxide is H2SO4. And if we look here, this one is actually balanced as it is. So these are how you would solve each of the four different types of um, synthesis reactions. So let's take a look at our learning goals again. Can you predict the products of synthesis reactions involving the formation of ionic compounds? And can you predict the products of synthesis reactions involving metal oxides and non-metal oxides? If you can do this, fantastic. If not, please re-watch the video. And if you're still having trouble, come ask me in class tomorrow. All right, that's all for now. Bye-bye.